Good morning. Um, good morning from Lanark Loch. Friday morning. And um, continuing on with the challenge that I have to do a vlog, a video blog type thing every day for a month. So here we are. And we um, started yesterday morning with fear of change. I'm doing some in an evening on addiction. And um, really interestingly, this morning, I met an older lady. Um, she's in her 70s, Jean. And uh, she's, she's just such a soul. And um, I was walking down the path there. And um, she kind of looked really nervous. I said, you all right, Jean? She said, yes, yes. I am fine, she's saying. And she says, but... You know, my daughter, she does everything by the book. She does absolutely everything by the book. And I'm just, I, I've just got so much fear in me that somebody comes up and taps me in the shoulder. I goes, why somebody got to come up and tap you in the shoulder if there's a two metre um, distancing rule in place? She goes, to tell me that I'm doing something wrong. I said, where did you get that belief from? She says, well, my daughter, she does everything by the book and she's telling me I shouldn't even have my dog off the lead. I said, you should have watched my Facebook Live video last night because it was about social contagion. And what's happened is your daughter's neurosis has travelled down the phone and landed on you like a herd of monkeys and it's jumping about inside you right now. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing. So, um, okay, tangent. Right, so yesterday, um, yesterday morning, my first one was on fear of change. Um, fear and change two different components but um, some of the stuff that I was talking about yesterday was being able to sit with our feelings and um, basically I'll abbreviate it very quickly but if you've been feeling angry for days you're not feeling angry what you're feeling is the avoidance of going into the motion the emotion now certainly with anger for me at least 75% of the time anger is always um, uh, it's like a protection mechanism because it's easier to feel angry than it is to feel hurt or to feel sad. So, um, I was speaking with a, I was speaking with you yes, 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 yesterday about um, sitting with the feeling and allowing it to trans, uh, transcend into something different. And I got a load of messages, but one was from a from a friend of mine locally, a local business owner in Lanark here, um, Christine, and she she said to me. What if when you feel the feeling, you get a reaction? So what if you feel the feeling of anger, and the example that she gave was that you then punch the door? So let me then go back the way, because before you're able to feel the feeling, you've got to be able to sit with it. Now, why we have such a strong reaction when the, the, the feeling comes up and takes over and we hit a wall... Right now, generally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here because this is slightly complicated. But when somebody triggers us, okay, when we get triggered, it triggers our reptilian brain and puts us into fight or flight. Now, where we feel that, okay, because there's a connection between our reptilian brain and our gut, is we feel that about three fingers, about five inches up from the top of our belly button and it's like a little electric charge that goes off, right? Now, our prefrontal cortex, the frontal part of our brain, our thinking and planning brain, is what is able to hold and um, discern between these negative emotions. Now, the prefrontal cortex is brought online by the attachment theory, the work of Bowlby. So if you're interested in that, the more secure the attachment that you have had created in your earliest of development, then allows you to have a structured and indeed more developed, because we can see that in um, fMRIs and indeed EEGs, that the prefrontal cortex of the brain is more developed. So, oh, good morning. I'm doing a Facebook live vlog thing. I'm not talking to myself. I know, I'm not. <laughs> um, fellow walker. Um, so, there was a prefrontal cortex. Now, through earliest attachment and attachment that we have that's safe and that we're able to make with, uh, with good acquaintances that we trust, that allows our prefrontal cortex to develop more um, efficiently. Okay? So, somebody triggers us. 
okay? We feel it at first in our stomach, okay? Very, very quickly, we've got a massive amount of chemicals, which is exactly the same as drugs. It's, it's yeah, it's identical. Cerebellum, the back of the brain, and whoosh, you're off. So, somebody says, um, your mum's a tramp. To a wee guy in the east end of Glasgow, or it could be anywhere, not being socially... Um, I'm not being socially judgmental, it could be anyone from anywhere that hasn't created bonding, who doesn't have big bonding or a secure attachment in their life. We kids together, your mum's a tramp, we Danny picks up a bottle, club, it's instantly, okay? So if we were working with little Danny, right, and we created safety, security, where he felt heard, met and seen, we were a fag father figure or we were indeed a mentor to wee Danny and Danny got a lot from us and Danny started to build re resilience and was able to manage his emotions a lot better because he's creating a secure attachment with those around him and indeed himself. His prefrontal cortex starts to come online and the more work that he does and we might take him out and do things like the John Muir Award and get him walking and get him in with other people and he starts to learn that he's safe and that he can be safe. What you will notice is when somebody says something derogatory towards him, of course the chemicals are still there, but there's a pause. And as Viktor Frankl says so eloquently, between stimuli and response, there is a space. Now, for so many people that just act on their emotions, they, they don't have that space yet, but it can be developed. It definitely can be developed, and it can be developed through making secure attachments, creating bonding, feeling connected, making the connection with others and their self, and indeed starting to get involved in hobbies, like making things. Because m m hobbies and making things like even art and drawing, and uh, for me I build like model cars, and I go into a trance, but I'm mindful. And mindfulness, meditation, and indeed prayer, that increases the left, the left occipital and the prefrontal cortex, okay? So by doing mindfulness activities, we can start to strengthen this muscle here, this muscle in the brain. And when the world is going mad round about us and people are saying derogatory things that may be true or untrue, we don't get triggered the same, okay? So that's to answer the question that Christine sent to me yesterday. I don't know if Christine's watching, but that's your question answered. Now... The videos that I'm going to be doing in the morning is on fear of change. So, fear and indeed change. So, oh, another thing. So, um, I'm, an, I'm an elder in Greyfriars in Lanark and um, it was so funny last night. We were on a, we were on a, we were on a meeting um, at the church like Zoom. There was about 12 or 13 of us in. And my minister kept saying, oh, well, it's going to be like this just now until we get back to some kind of normality. Right, and I'm looking at him and I'm going, what planet are you on, Brian? Right? <coughs> Some kind of normality. We've never gone back to the way that things were. Who would actually want to go back to the way that things were? You know, this massive reset that we're all experiencing, okay, is actually to springboard us into something different. So I wrote a wee message on the, on the Zoom chat and I was like that. Um, I sort of said that to him, and I think just as he read it, he went, so, um, we want to take a vote for who's going to be Presbytery Elder next week, <laughs> the Presbytery Elder, and I was like, Ross, so, my wee cheeky comment got me another year of being a Presbytery Elder for Presbytery, so, hi, thanks Brian, appreciate that, um, so, fear of change, fear, okay, now, Even the breath that we're taking is because we're afraid. It's that hunger for survival. Fear is about survival. And for so many of us, we're, we are actually surviving. We're, 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 we're getting up every morning and it's like we're, we're, we're running a marathon and it's like, you know, we've got to survive. And that level of fear that's running the show is very constrictive and it's also um, really unhealthy for us, right? So... It weakens our immune system, it's, um, it's, um, it's very constrictive, uh, it makes us tetchy, because when we're in a constant state of fear, we're getting a load of chemicals, 
And do you know, I'm going to share a story with you because about 15 years ago, right at this very part of Lanark Lock, this is where I learned about this. And I learned about it from the dog that I had at the time and I did a dissertation on it um, for uni. My dog used to walk this path every morning. I used to meet a gentleman on this walkway and he used to get out his car and he used to walk clockwise and I used to meet anti-clockwise so inevitably we used to meet around about this midway point and we both had two dogs and they were both off the lead and they would go into the squat position and as they were getting into the squat position and starting to approach one another they did the same thing every day for a number of years before it popped with me and got me to research this they would go up to one another, they would sniff one another's nose, sniff one another's backs, their, their heckles were up, they'd sniff each other's bottoms, and then they would be free. There was no animosity or aggression between the two of them, and they would both they would both then get away from one another. What was the very first thing they did, they both did every morning for a number of years. They'd go away and run about daft. They'd go and run about and run away daft. Because they've got an innate, they've got an innate knowledge that we have somehow forgotten. That when we have a release of cortisol like that, and adrenaline and noradrenaline and death and all of that stuff, when we get that chemical, they've got this superior innate understanding that I've not used it, I've not had to fight, I've not had to be aggressive. I'll get rid of this stuff. Why? Because it's toxic. It's absolutely toxic. But when you and I, we're in this system, we step out in front of a bus, the bus beeps its horn, whoosh, same whack of cortisol and adrenaline. What do we do? We, we, we get back off the pavement. Great, we're in safety. But our body's full of chemicals. Full of chemicals, more toxic than crack cocaine. And what we do is we then walk across the road and then we get in and we're a little bit late. We get into the office and the boss is sitting like that, staring at us. And then we've got into another fear response. Right? And then we got a phone call. Your deadline, you're late, you're this, you're that. Then you go back home that night and your credit card bill comes in and it's it's monstrous and we get another dose of cortisol. How are we burning that off? We're not burning that off. Right? It's just toxically consistently going through our system, which is playing havoc with our immune system. It's playing havoc with us at a cellular level. The mitochondrial of the cell, which is the oxygenating potential of the cell, isn't able to work effectively. Right? And our whole system is tight. So how do we get to be creative? How do we get to see out with the entrapment? But in actual fact, it's ourself that's trapping us. Because it's ourself that's being constricted by our own biochemical network within us. Right? So that's a little bit on fear. So we've got fear and we've got change. What is change? Well, change is something different. Right? Change is a different pattern of behaviour that we've became familiarised with. We've actually became institutionalised within our own thinking about our own paradigm and our own reality that we've started to believe that can be the only one. But it's not the only one. We are creators as God was. We have absolutely got the power to change the channel. What we're looking on right now, and right now this is what I'm looking on, right? This is what I'm looking out onto right now, okay? It's like a huge plasma screen TV, right? It's massive. And I have got I have got inside of me the power to turn the channel and change the remote control. Now, for an example, if somebody was with me right now, if someone was with me and um, giving you an example here, we're walking through the woods together and this other person's going, oh, it's so wonderful, look at these wonderful trees, I love these trees, I remember my grandfather, I remember he made me a tree house and oh, I've just got such a connection with trees and it's wonderful and I'm walking about like this, oh, trees, I hate trees, I hate trees. I remember when I was about 16 I went through the woods and I'd found a guy that had hung his cell on a tree, I fucking hate the woods. The woods are actually innocent. The trees are innocent. It's my perception of them that gives them the validation that I'm putting on them. Right? So what I've got to do is change my internal channel, my internal perception that I have on the trees in order for me to see a different reality, a different set of woods. Right? 
So at any point, we have got the power to change our internal narrative, to change the scripts and schemas that's running the show, and start to see a different reality based on our internal conditioning, right? So that's a wee bit on change. So we've got fear and we've got change and we've got those two components, right? Now, in a lot of ways, what I'm also noticing right now, and I notice this when I work on a retreat place, I work in a retreat place in Portugal quite regularly, and you've got to do an extreme diet before you go, and the diet when you're there is very extreme. See, by about the Wednesday, about halfway through, everybody's like that, oh, can't he wait to get home and get a steak? Can't he wait to get home and get a glass of wine? And that really hurts me, because you've done all the hard work. You've done the hard work, right? You've given up these behaviours, but you've not actually been doing it. It's like a white-knuckle sobriety. It's like a white-knuckle ride. And... Um, it's like a white knuckle ride that you're going on. So you're holding your breath, get to the end of the retreat. And what I'm noticing right now, people saying, can't wait for this lockdown to be over. I don't normally drink, but I can't wait. I'm going to go out and get blittered. Imagine what the crime rate's going to be like when they, when they open up lockdown. Crime rate's down by like so many percent right now. See the minute they enter lockdown, folk are going to go wild. They're going to be like kiddies in a, in a, in a, in a sweetie shop. But why? Why would you want to go back? We're going through the pain right now. We're going through the suffering. Why would you want to light up an old programme that you had before this all started? Use this as a massive catalyst for change. Right? Really? If you want to go back to the old way of thinking and being, great. But probably what you're doing right now is you're finding this lockdown really, really difficult because you're having a white knuckle sobriety. You're white knuckling it. You're not dealing with it. You're still an alcohol. Well, sorry, that's for this evening's talks. Let's not let, let, let me not in my mind um, get them crossed over, right? So fear and change. Um, we're doing the hard work. This is the hard work, and we can continue it. Okay, we can continue it beyond. We don't have to go back to how it used to be for ourselves. Now, if all of us develop that attitude, right? Because if we're in agreement that... Um, if we can start to accept the concept that our mind creates our reality, and the old mind that we all had was creating a reality that I think by agreement wasn't working... And what's currently happening right now is before we can transcend completely, like anything that we give up, we've had to give up our old life. It doesn't come for free. So if you give up smoking, it's going to be rough for the first couple of weeks. You give up alcohol, it's going to be rough for a couple of weeks. You give up... Um, hello, I'll wait till I show you this. I always think that's my grandfather. Look at that little robin, I could just reach out and touch him. A butterfly's my grandmother. And a robin's my grandfather. As I was talking, it was sitting looking at me there quite eerily. Um, what was I talking about there? Giving things up. So, the reality of which we were hab inhabiting, both personally and externally, wasn't necessarily working for us all. We give something up like cigarettes. It's going to be difficult for a few weeks. We give up a relationship. Right, let's split up. It's not working. Then we start to get those sexual compulsions and there's a familiar girl down the road that we were with for a couple of years and it's like, fancy hooking up. Rather than going out and meeting somebody new, we want to just revert back to the old programme, don't we? I think most of us would agree with that. So, currently right now, Scotland, the UK, is in day 11 of, of lockdown, right? Imagine we've just given up cigarettes. We've been going through the difficult stuff. The darkness is starting to come up for so many people, right? I read, um, I read, a, I read a post this morning. Uh, oh, people's negative sides really starting to come out. I can't believe what they're saying about school dinners and school vouchers and things like that. People are actually really nasty. Yeah, they are. But we put a lid on it and we walk about and kid on we're good people. We're not good people. We're not. We're nasty. We're a nasty bunch. But because of society, we walk about and we, I think we need to start getting real, just being who we are first so that we can transcend into being something much better. So, as my minister said last night, how I started this off, when we go back to some, when we go back to, when we go back to how things used to be, why would we want to? 
I'm encouraging those that are in my circle, those that I love and I care about, and if I can reach other people around it as well, we're all suffering right now. This is a very, very, very difficult time. Do you really want to go back to how you used to be? Let's use this as a springboard for change. So, videos I'm doing in the morning is on my, my perception. I'm not saying I'm right. There's many roads to Rome. Um, <clears throat> there's many ways to do this stuff. Um, I was just challenged by a colleague actually, and um, to do some videos. I'm doing some on a night around about addiction. It's things that I'm passionate about. So I found some stuff that I'm passionate about. And um, I'm doing some in an evening on addiction and I'm doing some in the morning around fear of change. So I really hope that that was helpful. And I hope that, um, I see that Stacey Coultley is watching. Hi Stacey, she's one of my, my First Nation. Uh, Friends, she's gorgeous. Maybe she's a big eagle round her neck. Um, and a uh, absolutely stunning lady. And a um, powerful woman. And a uh, lives up in uh, lives up my reserve in the west coast of Canada. So um, I hope you've understood my accent. I'm wishing you all a really excellent day. And whatever it is that you do. And... Um, God bless everybody. Have a great day. Embrace change. Don't feed it. Take care.